On Instacart, I can shop a huge selection of pet supplies, from that one brush that scratches him just right, to that extra comfy bed he can't wait to flop down in. And I get everything delivered right to my door in as fast as one hour. Okay, 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 settle down. I know it's here. Yeah, it's very exciting. Visit instacart.com or download the app to get a free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum order $10. Additional terms apply. Instacart. Add life to cart. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Join us as we seek the truth and travel the long road to justice. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi for Root Loop. What you know? Did you know that vacuum cleaners were originally horse-drawn? Really? Oh, my God. Can you imagine a horse in your house? No. What they would do, they would pull up to the house, and these big hoses would be hauled in through the windows. And they would vacuum out the house and the canisters was on the wagon with the horses, but everybody in your, in your, near your house could stand and watch how dirty your house is. Oh, wow. See, <laughs> that just goes to show you how my brain works. I never would have thought bring the hose in through the window. I'm like, why the heck would you put a big old horse in your living room to vacuum? <laughs> of course, yeah. I'm only too deep. This, this, this coffee's only number two. So yeah, I need three a- to get my brain firing on all cylinders. So yeah. we want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Two Cool T-Shirt Quilts. You can go to twocooltshirtquilts.com slash pretty lies and alibis. You actually are finally sending your T-shirts in for your Yankees yes. blanket. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, I love my Clemson one. And so lots of wedding season. You've got graduation season. Good time to think about getting that for either yourself or for a gift. So yes. what can they do, Fruit Loop? They can take your t-shirts and make them into a quilt that is too cool. Yeah. So if you guys are signed up for the Vine Link alerts for the last two days, your phone's been getting blown up about this time of day with uh, 60 plus notifications. It's very curious. Um, You know, we still haven't heard officially, of course, about competency, but so many weird things have happened this week. And it's kind of like, why are these Vine Links going off all of a sudden? Maybe it's a glitch in the system. Maybe it's more... Anyways, so we are going to be covering that hearing at 11 o'clock uh, East. No, 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 no. 11 Mountain Time, 1 o'clock Eastern. This was a very last minute, as far as we know, hearing that was posted yesterday, late afternoon for today. We don't know what this is about. Tomorrow we do have um, the motion to sever at 9.30 in the morning, and then at 11, the motion to allow additional evidence regarding the jury. So lots of things happening hearing-wise in his case, and we will see what's up. Yep. Crossing our fingers. All right, so we're going to finish up the Glimpse at Life, the transition from jail to prison today. We just did some news updates yesterday. And um, so the prison slang word for this episode is a heat wave, which is the attention brought to a group of inmates by the action or of one or a few. So essentially, if somebody in your block gets caught with contraband, they call it a heat wave because those rooms all in that that area seem to get tossed or gone through looking for contraband. So, dude, I'd be mad. I would be mad, too. Yeah. I know, but it's crazy. You know, I was talking to her the other night and I asked her, what's the weirdest thing people use for a shank? And she said, Jolly Ranchers. So they will use their heaters in their cell that they cook food on to melt down a bunch of Jolly Ranchers. And while it's soft, they roll it. And she said, it is like, you know, the worst. It's, they can make them long and a real, cause you know how, like when you suck on a Jolly Rancher, you can make it really pointed. Yeah. Well, I'm that's what they do. Cane. Huh? I used, to, I used to do that with a candy cane. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. 
Yeah. I, I bet they don't get candy canes in prison at Christmas time because that becomes the shank. Yeah. So one interesting thing, these are little little things that I guess you learn in prison. Um, so she was talking to me about painting your fingernails and toenails. So the other night, they actually made homemade toenail polish. What they use is color pencils and floor wax. She said you crush color pencils and dissolve them in liquid floor wax. You paint the nail with the mix, then put a coat of wax between each layer. You do that for six layers. And she said, if you do it right, it actually lasts as long as just store-bought fingernail polish. Dude, I ain't putting no liquid floor wax on. That That don't kill you. Uh, yeah, uh, you get creative, you know. So yeah. we know Jolly Ranchers become lipstick. So I guess since you can't get that stuff in the commissary, you make your own. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. All right. So back into the episode. I was asking her about culture shock. And she said that she experienced the worst culture shock of her life when adjusting to prison. Everything is different. Nothing functions as it does on the outside in any capacity. So first timers frequently fall into a very consuming depression. And the first few months in prison is a jolt to every single sense you have. Jail doesn't prepare you for prison. Not even close at all. It's two completely different worlds in how the institutions are, are run. She said, your body releases a lot of stress hormones and adrenaline on a constant basis in the beginning, which causes all kinds of mental health issues and physical issues. She's seen a lot of new arrivals constantly on edge, jumping in fear when any kind of loud noise happens or when arguments break out, which is kind of off and on all day. She said, the adrenaline release is your body's natural way of preparing you for fight or flight. She's seen fights break out with new arrivals who that it wouldn't have happened if defense hormones coupled with the stress weren't working against each other. Some new arrivals are hypersensitive and add punishment for acting out to a knee jerk reaction, which is kind of fueled by your hormones and your first few days can just be super traumatic. Well, so another, we huh? talked yesterday, we talked day before yesterday about it being like high school or right. Movie. So think yeah. about being in that environment with criminals. Yeah. Who's make, they've already made bad decisions. I mean, they're not the most upstanding citizens. Right. So do that and say, okay, you live with everybody in your middle school. Oh, I, yeah, no, I'm look, I hate drama. Yeah. I cannot imagine. And she said, it's just like high school mean girls on steroids. Yeah. Yeah. I just can't imagine every single move I make. I have to think, am I standing in the right place? Am I in the safe zone of where I can walk? Am I going to look at this person wrong and make an enemy? It, it yeah. just, she said that it's always, even with her having been there for 10 years now, that she's still not used to it. And she still learns what she can and can't do. Because like she said, you get somebody that comes in that's new and you think you know how to deal with them and you find out their personality is completely different and you have to learn everybody individually. If you don't, it, it opens you up to drama. Yeah. No. So stress hormones rise about 20 to 30% above the brain's baseline for those who are entering jail without a chemical or hormonal balance in the brain to begin with. Uh, if in jail, you don't talk about your case to anyone, uh, another inmate could turn around and use that to their advantage for a lighter sentence if you admit things that the prosecutor would want to hear. And that's a good point. Yeah, she saw that happen, actually. Um, she was in isolation some, but but chose to be out in general population. And there was a case where two girls got to be buddies, started confiding in each other a little more. The girl admitted her role in the crime, and therefore she went to her lawyer said, hey, my charges are not this big. I know stuff. She offered to testify for the prosecution, ended up the girl just pled guilty because her ship was sunk. Yeah. So uh, she says that the prisoners who are first timers have the most challenging acclimation. Uh, she's seen new arrivals cry in the corner for weeks until they finally accept their fate. Uh, people who are in for nonviolent crimes have the hardest time adjusting. 
and I honestly think that's when Chad and Lori get sent to that that final place. I think that's where they're both going to be. Yeah, and it's going to be such a rude awakening because if you look at somebody like Lori, who has pretty successfully up until a couple of years ago been able to manipulate and kind of fool people into thinking she's one way. I was talking to my friend the other night on the phone and she said people like her will very quickly make enemies and become an outcast for a lot of reasons, but mainly because if she goes into prison thinking she's going to manipulate and charm, it's going to be very short lived and it's going to be a rude awakening when she finds out there are people in there a million times better at all that than you ever thought you were. Yeah. And I, I think it, when you're in jail, they're trying to one, keep you safe so you can go to trial and be prosecuted. And I think when you get switched to prison, you're more of just a number. You are a number. And it's just in jail. It's if you're in jail, it's like we talked about previously, it's either people waiting for trial or people that are there for low level crimes that are less than a year. Typically, nobody's really looking to bring a lot of drama, although it does happen. But yeah. for the most part, it's just a rude awakening because when you go to prison, you're in there with people that are in for years, decades, the rest of their life. They have nothing to lose and they're not going to candy coat anything because honestly, she said a lot of times the um, correctional officers, unless it's just a vicious beating, they look the other way because there's mm. so much drama on a daily basis in every area. They can't police it. Mm. And then what happens is, even if people are doing things to you, like you don't snitch. Yeah. So you're stuck. I think it's prison's going to be devastating for Chad and Lori. Oh yeah. But you look at Chad, he's, he's such a, I I almost want to say unexperienced in the world. It seems like he just is a very boring, never had any kind of really exciting stuff going on aside from his little cult. And then he's going to be in there with like, I mean, Chad's a vicious killer. Clearly, yeah. he he he's going to match that. But up here, I, Chad ain't going to last in prison. Yeah, yeah. So she says newbies almost make, they always make two mistakes. Asking someone what they're in for and how long they have on their sentence. Um, you'd be surprised the number of people who haven't memorized phone numbers. This would get me because I don't. I just oh, yeah. my phone. <laughs> I ain't memorized the phone number since like 2001. Yeah. Uh-uh. And they forget that they can't pull their phone out. Uh, she has seen absolute breakdowns when new inmates realize they don't know any numbers to make that first call that you crave after intake. Uh, your only option is to write a snail mail letter and send an email if you're able to pay for a tablet. Uh, if you're extra chummy with the guards, it's a red flag for other inmates. It's like a catch-22. Mm-hmm. If you try to get on the good side of the guards, then you're going to be on the bad side of the inmates and vice versa. Yeah, and we were talking about that, and she said there's obviously benefits to both, to yeah. being more chummy with the inmates and not getting super close to the guards. But she said there are huge benefits to being chummy with the guards and that, you get a little extra pass here and there, but it, like you say, on the other hand, it sets you up Yeah. amongst the inmates, jealousy, that kind of thing. It's, man, yeah. I would be exhausted all day from just the drama. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of new arrivals lose weight, uh, but once you are more comfortable, weight gain is a big risk in prison. Uh, the food available in the commissary isn't healthy. And if you tend to stay in your cell, you don't get much exercise at all. When there's a staff shortage or an outbreak of COVID, you you could only be on lockdown for days. You will be on lockdown for days or weeks. Uh, you can't move in a cell with four other women in there. Uh, every move is almost coordinated when everyone is awake and on lockdown. Uh, and that's going to be a big issue for Lori because she's a health nut. Yeah. Um, like yeah. food and exercise and everything. Right. Yeah. Um, for her, she gets up and walks seven steps to the restroom, followed by five steps to the sink, followed by five steps to the bed, followed by seven steps to the shower. Yeah. So you can see, I think the minimum step count that you're supposed to shoot for every day is like 10,000 steps. And 
when you're in that tight of a space, you know, you're eating all this processed food that's full of sodium and fat. And I know she, for her, once she got used to prison, that first year, she actually gained 50 pounds. Wow. Wow. So speaking of COVID, uh, she said it always started with chow hall workers and then spread like wildfire in the prison. Uh, when someone is having a mental health episode, it can keep the entire block up all night. You can't turn on anything to drown out the noise. The newer inmates struggle to adapt to these situations, and it can be very scary for them. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you asked her if there's a lot of fakers of mental illness in there, and she said not as many as you would think because the psych unit is terrible. She said most will make that mistake once and then will learn the limit of where to stop in order to be medicated and nothing more. Yeah. Uh, she, she said that uh, she actually attempted suicide shortly after she got to prison. And she said never again, because I would not want to be on that unit another second ever. Yeah. Yeah. So she said that it's hard to spot the fakers because they are really good at faking. Also, some have been faking since they were children, and to them, they believe they now have the disorder. Some of these women had mothers who would claim they had ADHD and other disorders, so the mothers could get medication to take themselves, just that Munchausen syndrome. She said the best way to spot a faker is when they slip up. They might forget their tick is on the left-hand side and not the right. They may cry with no tears. They claim anxiety, but their pupils are not dilated and their body's calm. They will have every single symptom in the book, but here, honestly, a lot of fakers love to boast and teach how they did it to show other people how to become fakers too. When you go into crisis mode, which is an attempted suicide, self-harm, cutting, something like that, they strip you down and you get a Velcro dress. You are placed in a room with staff sitting outside of your door and watching you 24-7 until the psych releases you. You must ask for toilet paper each time you need it. Nothing is in the room except for a plastic bunk and a toilet. She said in county jail, there was a hole in the ground and the staff flushed it. She said, I'm not sure how they do it there. Or it, she hasn't been to the psych ward in the prison she's at now, so she's not sure how they do it there. You're not allowed to uh, have utensils to eat with, even plastic, which they have in prison. There's no metal. They're more paper. People in crisis are given a cardboard scoop to eat with. Some fakers will say they feel like they want to hurt themselves so they can get the psych to take them serious or sympathy from friends and lovers. They're caref careful to time it so they don't have to stay in for more than 24 hours. They can keep you up to 72 hours in the psych ward on a 5150 hold, which is involuntary. I, I saw a guy in our county jail that was on suicide watch, and he was in like this big Gumby suit. It was yeah. this big green suit, and it had like holes where you go to the bathroom. Uh, it was very cumbersome. Mm -hmm. But she said that the psych unit is a sad place, and there is a mix of fakers as well as people with real mental illness. She said, for the most part, people are screaming. It's unsanitary. You don't get the shower. Uh, people don't wipe after going to the bathroom. They have explosive anger. She said what they do as far as activities, you could attend art therapy, talk therapy, exercise outside, and one-on-one -on -one therapy. The unit stinks of human filth, as does the medical unit, um, the inmates react violently and will break windows. All the furniture is solid and bolted to the floor. There are timeout in cages that they can put you into. They're seven foot tall and about three to four feet on each side. And they lock people up when they become what she said, disruptive. Mental health patients do eat in the chow hall, but they usually go last because of the high risk of outbursts of and the risk of physical um, violence that delays the rest of the people from having their meal and that can get ugly. So she said one big nuisance is if someone gets unruly and needs to be pepper sprayed in the cell block, you're likely to get a whiff of it and you experience symptoms as well because there's no ventilation. It just kind of hangs in the air. 
when there's a fight in the cell block, common areas, everyone gets on the ground until the nurse comes to check for injuries on the people who are fighting. Sometimes this can take 30 minutes or more if that nurse is busy. So you're laying on a concrete floor uh, waiting for 30 minutes. One unpopular thing to be is a troublemaker in your cell block because sometimes your whole cell block can be punished for things you do. If there are frequent flight fights, frequent flights, I'm sitting here thinking about airfare, uh, or disruptions that can cause people who aren't involved to get their mail or canteen or free time taken away. And you can imagine what that does for your popularity. <laughs> oh, yeah. She said one of the weird things that's hard for her every day is not being able to choose an outfit or being able to go where you want. And after a while, it just really builds. And she said little things like this become big when it's a daily reminder that your life is not your own there. She said sometimes the littlest thing will cause your spirit to totally break, not necessarily big things. And she said at where she's at, they do keep the prisoners busy because it cuts down on drama. And the problem is they make you go to school. They make, or, you know, you have to choose one like school treatment program, work program. The problem is in the evenings, it limits the amount of time you have to talk to your loved ones because so many people are wanting to get on that phone. That leads to fights and arguments if people feel you're taking too long, which we heard that story about Chad where an inmate was banging on the wall because he was taking his sweet time on the phone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she says COVID has dramatically changed how the prison she is in functions. Uh, staff shortages have increased the amount of free time the inmates have outside of their cells with some lockdowns lasting weeks. At her prison, they weren't allowed to go in the yard for weeks. Uh, this has led to increased cell drama between people who are stir crazy that you can't get away from. Uh, if one person tests positive, the whole block is sent to an isolation building for quarantine. At the height of COVID in 2020, they were locked down for weeks on end. Yeah, it was frequent because we kept in contact. There was a period where her tablet broke and we just weren't able to communicate. But at one point, I think it was seven weeks that they they were in their cells pretty much i would go crazy oh yeah because think about it i mean when i walk outside now i take a deep breath of fresh air and it's just good to take take in fresh air oh yeah but can you imagine not being able to do that can you imagine being in such a confined space with three to four people and every little habit starts to grate on your nerves she said that there was one lady that had um, that was getting over COVID and was past the exposure point, but she was constantly sucking her snot, like sniffing. And she said it was every eight seconds for a week. And she said they all were just ready to punch the wall because unless you shove some toilet paper down in your ear, you got to, you know, it's just little things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So as lockdowns got more fre frequent, so did the making of hooch. Uh, they used anything from candy, beets, corn, uh, and fruit to make it. Uh, when it's when done, it's a little stronger than wine. And didn't you say they make it in the toilet? Sometimes, um, yeah. Uh, and then sometimes they'll like tape it in a bag underneath their their bunk. There's all kinds of really creative ways to do it. I mean, she sent me a lot of information about how they get away with little things. That'll be a whole other episode of yeah. how to how to hide contraband and all that stuff yeah so in jail the officers are deputies first then employees uh, in prison they're employees first and correctional officers second uh, in prison you can get away with a little bit more as long as you aren't hurting anyone or interfering with their jobs she said for the most part if correctional officers enforced every little thing they would never stop writing people up for small infractions uh, friendship is the risk of codependency. Uh, she says she sees couples who will sabotage their mate's chance to go home so they won't be alone. It's casually referred to as taking someone's date. Uh, you set them, you set them to getting a getting a ride up, which costs days. A parole board will roll a person over one, three to five years or more for a ride up. 
Uh, a rollover is when the board denies the, to release someone and sets their next evaluation for years in the future. Uh, friendships risk financial, emotional, physical, psychological, and freedom dates, yet human nature compels us to make friends. Uh, it's bittersweet when a friend gets paroled. While everyone is happy for them, the lifers don't have the potential to get out. And when someone leaves, it's a reminder that that will never be you. Yeah. And she said that friendships in prison are mostly convenient. You're forced to live together. So most friendships only last in prison. She said, for the most part, you can spend years with somebody only to never hear from them again when they're paroled. It's a reminder that on the outside, you probably would have never hung out with that person, but on the inside, you're thick as thieves. And that's just survival. She said, there are packs of women who do everything together in prison. And for the most part, friends in prison fulfill the needs of the moment. And she said, essentially, you're kind of forced to play a game, even if you don't want to play. Relationships can last decades in prison, but not a month outside. She knew a couple who got paroled close together last year. And after 20 years together in prison on the outside, three weeks later, they were done. So it's just a reminder that that relationship usually just serves a purpose. She said, um, a person's sentence is set at 80%, 20% off the top if you're eligible for parole. That's what the courts assign you. Any negative behavior takes away from some of that 80%. And any good behavior, such as doing groups, work, school, et cetera, you get more time off in addition to that 20%. She said, and I asked her, is there a sense of regret among the inmates about the crimes they committed? She said, most inmates do not lose sleep over their crimes. Oftentimes, they begin to see themselves as the victim due to the in inconvenience of incarceration. So they make themselves the victim because they're paying the price for what they did. She said, unlike on TV, it's not really a daily fight for survival from other inmates. It's more, she said, the biggest fight is boredom, homesickness, and other self-inflicted things. The potential for violence is real, though, every second. So that just adds another layer of stress of constantly having to be vigilant. She said, the sad thing is the number of people who have had severely traumatic childhoods is just astronomical. It's not su surprising to her. A lot of these in inmates ended up where they did. Many of them were abused, abandoned, raised by addicts, or had parents who were incarcerated themselves. And she said, it really does. You start to see that cycle kind of handed down generation to generation. And at the same time, you have people like her who never saw a courtroom a day in her life and that was a law-abiding citizen until the wrong choice changed all that. One fellow inmate was an educator in elementary school and she started popping pills. She started taking Valium and Xanax for stress and the source started giving her other things to try. It turned into a full-blown addiction and she's in for robbery and left behind very a very normal marriage and four kids, but the pills took over. It's like she had to get them, and so nobody in her family had a history. So you see where that, that big, you know, you may have somebody who's been in and out since they were 15, or you have that woman who's 40, never got in trouble, but just got hooked on something. She said that's everywhere. Yeah. I think, and we keep comparing this to Lori and Chad because that's what we want to know, what they're going to be facing when they go, or with the other cases with Letitia and all the other ones we're covering. But with Lori and Chad, look at Lori's life. I mean, when she was with Charles, she had anything she wanted. Oh, yeah. And, you know, Kay, I think I mentioned this before, Kay made a comment on Reddit that, you know, Somebody asked, I, I don't know what it was about, essentially about her being in the mental health unit and not in jail. And Kay said, look, she loved to be by the pool and lay out. She isn't getting to do that. I'm good. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I think that it's, and the thing is, they, even if they were to be in protective custody for the first few years, that is worse than being out in the gin pop because it is 23 hours alone <laughs> in your cell with very minimal communication, even with staff. And yeah. I've read so many articles where you've got these big, bad, multiple murdering dudes who are like, I was broken. 
by the end of my stay. So none of this is going to be a cakewalk or easy for them for a million reasons. Do you want to stop here? Yeah, that's fine with me. That'll work. Um, I think we got one more episode to finish this out. We're going to watch this hearing at 1 Eastern, see what happens with that. We may do a YouTube short if it's nothing major. If it's something big, we may be back on later. But, uh, yeah, so one more episode. We'll finish this up. And it seems like everybody's enjoying this. It's been a while since we've done it. But we've had a lot of comments, you know, people saying, wow, you know, I never thought about this happening in prison or that. So I'm really glad that we do have this source because, and if you guys have questions, shoot them on our social media. I'll put a a post up. If you have questions you want me to ask her, she's very willing to answer anything. Um, So yeah, shoot some questions. I'll email them over to her and maybe in the future we can uh, cover those. All right, guys, have a good rest of your day. We'll see you soon. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.